Hello, mentors. Welcome to our podcast series, Mentorships in Education, brought to you by Just Education at JustEducationFirst.com. I am your host, Judy Epstein. I am very excited about the wide range of experts who have volunteered to give up their time and expertise. They will share their innovative ideas, their exciting perspectives, their rich resources, and their research with us. Please continue to delve into these topics on their websites and with your legal counsel, healthcare provider, and education professional. Our guests will have information that will be relevant to mentors supporting struggling students, parents, teachers, administrators, legal support, and health professionals. We will address all levels of education with issues that affect academic performance. Our goal is to open discussions and introduce a variety of approaches to those searching for information in a free venue. So mentors, let me introduce our guest for today. Welcome everybody. We've been exploring neurodiversity and the impact that our present educational and family situations have had on our children. Some may have had challenges to begin with, and others who have always managed may now find that they're academically, socially, and emotionally overwhelmed. How has technology affected these areas in the past, and how is it affecting our neurological development now with everything from eating disorders, anxiety and spectrum diagnoses, to typical individuals? who never had issues before because of all the electronics on which we have come to depend. Our guest today can shed some light on these important questions and the result of some of the research that he's been doing for years, we're going to find out a little bit about. Welcome so much, Mark. I appreciate your being with us today and for the time that you've given us. Uh, Before we get into Uh, having a discussion with Dr. Mark Williams, I want to give you a little background on on Mark, because he has quite an extensive resume. Um, Mark is a professor of cognitive neuroscience at McGuire University for more than 20 years. He's experienced in research and teaching and has over 70 publications. Mark has studied how we interact with each other, how we learn, and how we think. He has studied these questions in average individuals, as well as a range of disorders such as autism, face blindness, dementia, addiction, and eating disorders. He's received awards from the C.J. Martin Fellowship from the National Health and Medical Research Council and Queen Elizabeth II Fellowship from the Australian Research Council. His work has been highlighted in media, ABC, the UK, nationally and internationally, uh, USA, the BBC, many outlets. You can read more on the website if you want to take the time. Mark has been doing research as a scientist at MIT and the McGovern Institute for Brain Research here in the United States. When the first smartphone was released, that goes back a little way. He's watched in both fascination and apprehension at the rise of technology in our education systems. In addition to his teaching and research, Mark now runs programs for schools, parents, and businesses, and individuals to address the many problems that technologies like smartphones are creating. And I'm going to use that as my segue into starting Mark on a bit of a discussion. Um, Dr. Williams, can you give us a little bit of background on some of the research that you are doing? And I know a lot of it has to do, started with, I, I think you told me on, with people who have been diagnosed with autism, but who are in the gifted end of the spectrum. And the ways that we use to communicate that they may have some difficulty with like facial expression, body language, eye gazes, and so forth. So maybe you can fill us in a little bit on that, if you would, please. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Um, so when I 
started my undergraduate course, I started working, obviously trying to earn money, as we all do when we're doing undergraduate <laughs> courses. Um, I started working in the area of autism, which I found fascinating um, at the time. And I was working both with uh, high functioning and low functioning. So I started with low functioning and I was working, um, I was doing 24 hour shifts in a home where we had um, t- teenagers and young adults who had severe autism um, and also behavioral problems. So they were, they'd been in and out of psychiatric, psychiatric homes and so on. Um, most of them had violent tendencies um, and they were in a, in a locked home. And we would go and stay there for 24 hours at a time um, looking after those individuals, wow. which was quite a fascinating yeah, <laughs> experience. Um, I loved doing it, but I, I really did um, because there's so much um, change you can see when you actually work with these individuals and so much you can actually do with these individuals, which is really cool. But at the same time, I was also doing research because I was um, at university, so I was working with high-functioning individuals or gifted individuals who had... Um, what we used to call Asperger's syndrome. Now it's, I think, a little bit out of um, vogue at the moment to use Asperger's and use hypertension and autism. I'm not sure which way. Yeah, it's, I've heard you know, that they don't the use that anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay. So back then we used uh, we used Asperger's. Now we don't use Asperger's. Um, but they were high functioning individuals, um, and they were also fascinating because um, they, they were basically geniuses in one aspect of their life, but then. They had huge problems with um, social communication, and that's what we worked a lot on. So these were individuals who were um, late teens, early 20s. They were trying to get jobs. Um, they were trying to live independently, um, and they had all the faculties to do that. But um, they, had, they had huge um, difficulty with just normal you know, relationships um, and actually having those relationships, which made it really, really difficult for them to, to hold down jobs. Um, and to, to, to have friendships um, and relationships in, in the real world, which is, I don't think we realise how much of an impact that actually has on someone's life and how much that can really impact um, their ability to, to live independently and to... Very isolating. It's very yeah, isolating. Really isolating. Really isolating. And, um, yeah, there was some really funny um, things that went through. But the big problem is that, it's really difficult to teach someone those social cues because the social cues are all automatic. Um, and most of the social cues we get not from verbal communication, but by other, um, means of communication and things that have evolved over, you know, hundreds, millions of years. Um, and we, we now rely so much on this verbal communication to teach people. Um, but it's all those other cues that we have actually used for millions of years that that, that are affected in autism and um, other disorders like autism where the social communication um, areas are broken down. And it's virtually impossible to teach those social cues. I uh, worked um, for a number of years with a student who's been trying to teach this simple uh, eye gaze cues to, to students with, well, not students, to, to, to people with autism. Um, and, you know, we've been working on that since, well, since I was an undergraduate. Um, and, and it's still impossible. We still don't know how to teach um, people with autism. These skills like, that you're talking about, facial expression, body language, eye gazes, I think you explained to me that these are um, evolutionary tools that we've developed over many, many years. And um, you, you alluded to the, the, that they really aren't something that's taught, but we seem to be able to develop them as we... Uh, age as we mature, but young people on the spectrum have difficulty with these. It doesn't. Yeah. Matter. So, so we we we. Um, I mean, it's speculation. It's at, at least eight million years we've had the ability to read facial expressions, um, body language, um, eye detection, um, and and just understanding that different faces mean that it's different people. Um, and so those things we've evolved. We think probably 150 million years, um, at least eight to nine million years. We know that we've been evolving those things. Language we've only had, um, it's difficult to know exactly when a language came about, but sophisticated spoken language came about somewhat most, most researchers think between 150 and 50,000 years ago. So it's only in the last 
150,000 is, is the maximum we think based on most of the research. So 150,000 years ago, we evolved the ability to have sophisticated language and majority of people have only been reading for the last generation or so. Um, before that, it was a really small percentage of the population that actually learned how to read. So reading and, and spoken language is something really, really new. And it's actually, we, we don't have areas of our brain that are dedicated to those. We actually take over other areas of our brain. Um, oh. That is the, the, the Hain actually talks about that, the, the reuse theory. And we actually, one of the areas which is really fascinating is uh, <laughs> his fusiform face. Are you saying we recycled parts of our brain to develop new ways of using it? Yes. Yeah, so we, we use really? other areas that have become automatic. And so they become automatic. So we don't need as much of our brain to actually do them. And then we use those to do other things. So language is a great example of that. So, you know, we have this area called the fusiform face area. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Nancy Camrisher in at MIT and she discovered the fusiform face area, which is a, an area on the, the bottom of the brain. Um, and it's involved in face perception. And we see it in all that in basically all social animals. Cows even have fusiform face areas um, in their brains because they recognize each other by the right. Well. So that's how old it is, this this area. But there's um two of them, one on the right and one on the left. And most humans who can read. The one on the left-hand side is very, very small, and right next to it is the uh, visual word form area, which is how we recognise words. But um, Stan, um, he went to Brazil and he looked at a literature of people and showed that they actually didn't have a visual word form area because they didn't know how to read, and they had two very large visual, um, fusiform face areas. And then when he taught them to read, the left-hand side of the fusiform face area decreased in size and the visual word form area formed over the top of it. So actually, because they learned how to read, they formed over the top. So we don't. Sorry. You were... No, no, I, I just, my, um, you don't have to stop every time it looks like I got a, a light bulb went off in my head. But um, I'm just wondering, um, do uh, people who are diagnosed on the spectrum, is there physical property in this part of the brain different than a typical person? Yeah, great question. So we know that they, so there, there's been a couple of studies, um, one with a, a, an individual with autism. So his fusiform face area was acting to, uh, to Pokemon um, because he was really interested in <laughs> Pokemon. So rather than um, to human faces, he, his was really active and, um, seem to be coding for Pokemon characters because that's what he was really interested in. So there, there is a difference in there, the, the, how that area, the physical base area is coding. Um, it, it, it seems to be still there because it is such an old, um, area of the brain that it still develops in kids with their autism, but it just seems to be used for other things because that's what they're really interested in rather than faces. Um, which is, yeah, really interesting that they're using it for something else, which again comes back to this reuse theory. That yeah. if you know one thing, we'll start using it for something else so that it can be adapted to. And it's usually not as good at that, but it can be used for that, and so therefore we use it for that. Are you saying that Pokemon can help develop the brain, the skill center for, I mean, I'm saying Pokemon, but the concept of Pokemon can help develop some of these skills with certain no, individuals. The issue there was that he was he was obsessed with Pokemon, and so therefore he focused on the Pokemon, and therefore wasn't developing the face. Oh, wasn't definitely. okay. All right, just yeah. reverse. And, All right. Yeah, he, he didn't develop those because he, he used it for that rather than the faces. So we need them to really concentrate on the faces. Actually, so it gets yeah. back to the how technology can inhibit some of the the uh, skill development that we hope um, to see children acquire as they get older. Um, mm. So you talked to me, I mean, I think this would be a good place perhaps for you to talk about some of the components of learning that you were talking to me about at one point, consolidation and so forth. Um, maybe you can talk about that and how it, it relates to this uh, process of developing different parts of the brain and also what comes naturally maybe and what needs to be um, explicitly taught, I'll say. 
Yeah. Um, so we know that there's um, five aspects to learning. You need all five of them for someone to actually learn something, and they are um, connection. So you need connection to the teacher or whoever you're you're learning from. Um, you need um, attention. So actually to be attending to what you're doing. Um, you need consolidation. So you need to consolidate the information after you've actually learned it. You need error of feedback, which is really, really important. And I think something that most people forget about and a lot of teachers forget about, or well, at least here, um, and something I've spent a lot of time. So say that again. What is it? Error feedback. So feedback. Okay. You'll explain that, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I've forgotten who I'm up to. Couldn't <laughs> <laughs> attention, consolidation, error feedback, and um, oh, what have I done? I've forgotten the last one, and I'll remember it in a minute. I'm very All sorry. Right. Well, why don't you just go start talking about the others, and then it'll come so, to you. So, yeah, so connection is yeah. really important. So you need to actually connect to whoever you're actually trying to learn from. And we know, um, again, from a lot of research, um, that we actually, if we don't have a connection with the teacher, we don't actually learn from them. And the reason for that is that we have, um, we, we, we've, we've evolved, we, we originally evolved in, um, family groups. So we stuck to family groups because they were very protective for us, right? So we, we, we would, we would stay in family groups and they would, um, protect us and we'd all work together to actually, you know, keep everyone safe. And that's what you see in lions and you've seen tigers and you've seen elephants and all these. Huh. We would have been the same. And at some stage we actually started living in large groups, but we still needed to know who was in our group and who wasn't in our group. So we've evolved this amazing mechanism to actually know who's in our group and who's not in our group and to trust people who are in our group and not trust people who aren't in our group, which means that we only learn from people who are in our group and we don't learn from people who aren't in our group, Mm -hmm. which is a really important thing for teachers to remember because if they have a class and some of the students don't feel as though they're part of that group, part of that in-group, they're not going to actually learn from that teacher because that teacher is not part of their in-group. And this is something that goes back millions and millions of years and really entrenched in our brains and not something that we're actually aware of most of the time, but we actually hear differently. So there's a lot of research now showing that if you feel as though you're part of the group, you hear what people within that group actually say differently to people who are in your ad group. I mean, you know, I think there's some great examples of that recently. I think, you know, um, making Australia, making America great again, the MAGA group is a great mm-hmm. example of that. You know, somebody who's a member of MAGA will hear what Donald Trump said differently to someone who's not a member of MAGA because of the fact that we have this very old system in our brain, which actually means that we hear things differently and we actually hear them differently. It's not That's just a great that. example. Yeah, yeah. And so you're actually going to hear those things very differently. Uh-huh. And it's the same in the classroom. Yeah, they're going to hear that. And, and we've all heard the stories about the teacher who connects with all the students really, really well and they're amazing and all the students do really well because of the fact that they have this real good connection. Or, or the teacher who, you know, is struggling with the student because they just can't make a connection with them and they don't actually learn. So the connection is number one when it comes to learning. And I think teachers need to be more aware of that connection that they need to make with students. And I think schools need to be more aware of that as well and realise that if there happens to be a student who's not connecting with the teacher, then it might, you know, need some intervention where you actually move into another class that they have a better connection with or, mm. you know, try to intervene in some other way. But um, we also need attention. So you need to attend to things. You don't see anything if you're not actually attending to it. Um, monkey business is um, <laughs> a little video on YouTube that I think everyone should look at, which is just... You know, you, you, you've got to concentrate on a basketball. And when you concentrate on the basketball, you don't see anything else. Um, and, and that also happens um, in the classroom. So if you're attending to one thing, you're not going to see anything else. So you're not going to learn. So if you're attending to the person beside you, you're not going to attend to the teacher and you're not going to hear what the teacher has to say. That's where the devices are a really big problem because we know now that if there's... Uh, if there's a device near you and it's turned off and it's your device that you use regularly, then 10% of your attention is on the device, even if it's turned off and it's put away. So um, great example that they've done a lot of this in cars, um, looking at the effect of mobile phones on, on drivers. And if you have your mobile phone or your smartphone turned off and in your glove box, 10% of your attention is still on your smartphone in your glove box. 
even though it's turned off and put away in the glove box. Mm. Now, 10% of your attention is equivalent to one standard drink. So that's one standard drink of basically that you've had before you actually do anything else. Now, if your smartphone's actually turned on and beside you, then it's far worse than that. <laughs> you have a student who's in a classroom and they've got a mobile phone or a laptop or an iPad and it's turned off and it's in their drawer or it's in their bag, then 10% of their attention is on that device. So that's equivalent to one standard drink they've had before they even start doing any work, which I think, as you probably know, having a standard drink before you go into the classroom and try to learn something is not great for your learning ability. Now, if it's actually turned on, then it's far more than that. And we also have the problem that you need to be um, attending, but also you need to hold that information in your working memory. So you need to hold the information in working memory for enough time for it to be transferred to this temporary store so then at night when you're sleeping it get, then can get transferred to your long term. If there's any disruption, that is if your attention is drawn to something else during that little period that you need to transfer it, then you lose everything that you just learned. So the last 90 seconds of what you were just learning is lo- lost if there's any disruption. Now, a disruption could be something like a phone rings or someone comes into the classroom or there's a notification on your device. So if there's anything bops or bings or dang or does a little jump or any of those sorts of things on your smartphone or on your laptop or on your, then you lose the last 90 seconds of your mm. learning, which means that there's lots of interruptions during the class. Yes, there are. Which means there's lots of time that's been lost. Unless you go back and revise what you're just doing, you've lost that information, which is really, really scary. Um, and there's a recent study just, just looking at interruptions from um, you know, phone calls to the classroom um, and people knocking on the door. And it showed that most schools here in Australia anyway lose about two or three days every term, equivalent to two or three days every term, just based on interruptions from phone calls to the teacher and knock, knocking on the door. Um, that didn't factor in the students' own interruptions when it comes to notifications and stuff that they get on their laptop and they yeah. get on smartphone and so on, which is a real, real problem. Um, and then we've got error feedback. So error feedback right. is extremely important for learning because you don't learn anything if you're correct. So we've known for a long time that if you um, learn something, the Ebbinghausen um, forgetting curve, um, he, he studied this 150 years ago, but basically you're 100% correct when you first learn something because you just, just learned it. And if you taught, tested someone straight away, they'll be able to tell you what they've learned. And then we, we forget things very quickly after that within the next couple of days. And what you want to do is you want to revise that information at the right time. Now, if you revise something that, and you get it correct, so if you ask someone um, uh, what colour are oranges um, and they get that correct, then they keep forgetting it at the same rate because they got it correct, so they didn't actually update it. Whereas if they get it wrong and they say, oh, green, and you say, no, it's orange, then they nice. update it and they forget it much, much more slowly, yeah? Right. So right. you actually got to do that. You've got to, you've got to be wrong a lot to actually remember anything. Um, no, that's, is- that's an important point. I just want to stop you there for a minute because kids have the idea that if they don't know the answer or if they feel they're going to look foolish by not um, being right, that they don't want to engage in the activity. And what you're saying is that it's important to give feedback if you have some erroneous thinking so that it be corrected so that you can then move forward and be more successful. So, yes, absolutely. So this yeah. idea of failure and success, it, it's not a dichotomy like that. They go together. Yes, yeah, extremely important. And it's really important in the classroom, and I, I spend a lot of time working with teachers on this because a lot of teachers have, have come from the idea that you know you stand at the front of the class and you ask questions and then everybody puts up you know their hand who knows the answer. Of course, the only people who put up their hands are the kids that know the answer. Right. So Hermione Granger puts up her hand. The kids who don't know the answer probably don't like the Mon- I like Hermione Granger, but we'll, we'll use Hermione Granger because everyone knows it. Um, the kids who don't like Hermione Granger aren't in her in group, so they turn off. So they're now not listening. She tells the right answer and gets a yes, you're right, but she hasn't learned anything because she already knew the right answer, right? So she right. hasn't learned in that process. And all the kids who needed to learn that 
have all turned up because they're not part of her in group. So right. they're not going to listen to the answer anyway or actually take any notice of it. Um, so, so that's a real issue in the way we actually teach because we're actually only teaching kids already know what they, the information. So you brought up um, uh, the point, uh, and I'm going to go back, up, back to Pac-Man for a minute, how uh, Pac-Man, the game Pac-Man, might interfere with some of the um, development tool process that we, we need to go through in order to uh, learn some of these skills that you've been talking about. And so I want you to address a little bit the idea of this technology in our schools and what some of the research is showing, because at this point, most of us, and I, you know, I, I take myself as, you know, probably top of the list here, um, we're using every single tool, technological tool that we have at our disposal to keep the attention of kids. And very often they go from one thing to the next and it's all this technology. So, you know, put me on the straight and narrow here. What's what's your perspective of that with your yeah, research? So, so the, the fifth one that I forgot is engagement. Oh. And that's, that's, okay. that's the fifth one, which is, this is what this is really important for. Because what, what, we, what the research shows is that they're, not actually attending when you've got the device, but they're engaged. And there's a big difference between engagement and wow. attending. Being attending to something is intending to the right things, intending to attending to what you've actually got to learn. Being engaged just means that you're actually doing something. Yeah. And, and what, what they show and what all of these um, learning apps and learning programs and everything show mm-hmm. is that the students are engaged. And yes, they're engaged, but they're not attending. They're not getting error feedback most of the time. They're not connected because there's nobody to connect with. You need to connect with a person, not with the device. We know that there is no connection between you and the device. So I'm going to stop you there. It's important to engage with a person, not a device. If If all the kids are sitting in the room and they all have their little headsets on and their, you know, little screens in front of them and they're all at their their stations and they're doing uh, a practice math app or a spelling app, that's not learning. No. No. That's being engaged in huh. that way. But that's not actually learning. You're not you're not engaged. You're not connected. You're not attending to the right things because most of those apps and uh, we can't do this over there. <laughs> uh, uh, without doing it visually. But most of those, there's a huge amount of research showing, um, so this research is done in, has been done in Europe for many, many, many years now. And what they do is they either give the students, and they've done it with preschoolers, they've done it with primary schools, they've done it with secondary school, they've done it with university students, and they've done it with um, older individuals. And they give the, the group either, um, a PDF which has been printed out, so a paper version of the PDF, or they group it to them on a device, and they've done it. The devices they've used have been laptops and they've been personal computers and they've been iPads and all the different combinations. They've done thousands of these studies. And they give them, if they give them the same amount of time to learn that information and then they test them afterwards and they can either test them on the device or they can test them on paper, mm-hmm. um, there's a drop in their learning between usually between 10 and 30 percent sometimes even more if you learn on a device compared to oh, it smokes really yeah wow. and there's multiple reasons for that the other big problem is that they've also tested the cortisol level which is the level of stress and they're always significantly more stressed if they've learned on the device compared to learning on paper oh. So you've got increased stress, which is not good for learning anyway because the problems with cortisol. Um, and they're not actually learning as well when they actually then do it on the thing. And there's, there's four reasons for that. One is there's no uh, links and anchors. So we know that if you learn from a book or a piece of paper, what you do is you remember where you're reading something, not only based on what you're actually reading, but where it is on the piece of paper, because we're, we're multi-sensory. We, we never learn anything just by the words. We learn by all of the other things that are going on around us. And so you actually learn, oh, I read that paragraph because it was at the top of the page and it was this page on this side rather than this page on this side or there's a little figure here <laughs> that, and so on. So 
when you're on a device, it actually all just scrolls up and down. So there's no links and anchors because there's no new pages associated with us, with it. So therefore, you've got none of those links and anchors to actually remember the information. Like. It's almost a mnemonic device, the, the positioning. Yeah. The positioning. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you don't get any of those links and anchors. You've also got the physical aspect of actually turning over the pages, which again, we, we, we learn multi-sensory. We don't learn by just, so all of that process of turning the paper and reading here and reading here changes all that. With again, on a device, it's all in the same spot and you're doing exactly the same thing every time you do it. So we don't have all those extra links and anchors either. The other problem is it's really difficult to find something. I don't know if you had this problem when you're scrolling up and down. So if you want to go back and check something because you forgot something or you want to, yeah, uh-huh. it's much harder on a device because it scrolls up and down. Whereas on a piece of paper, you can easily click backwards and forwards. A, because you remember it better. So you remember where it was because we use all that. Right. It. And it's much easier to find it. So people don't get frustrated by the fact that they can't find something when they click backwards and forwards. There's also yeah. the human connection that you mentioned to me when we were talking that idea yeah. of engaging in a group rather than interacting with technology. The technology, yes. Yeah. Technology is designed very cleverly so that it captures our attention because the technology companies, most of the apps and stuff, um, it, it's about solo endeavor. Yeah. It's about putting your attention into the device. So you stay on the device. It's not about being open to everything else. So when you don't have a device there and you're sitting, in a classroom, you, you're aware of the people around you, which again gives you more information that you can actually use to store that information in your brain. You know, I, I, I talk to teachers a lot about, um, moving students around when they're learning different subjects because you remember better that way. Yeah. When I was learning this, so and so was sitting beside me this side and the, I was at the end of the bench on this side. That actually contributes to remembering way that information. And so you can, when you're in a test, you can go, I was learning that when I was sitting there next to so-and-so, and you'll remember it better. It's like when um, you smell um, um, cinnamon, and then whenever I smell cinnamon, I remember my father because he used to love apple pie. Um, and so all those memories about my father come back when right. I smell cinnamon. Yeah, it's the same thing. If you multi-century, remember everything multi-century, right. you can use all those cues to remember them. When you're on a device, it's all exactly the same. You're in this device, so there's nothing new about that. And you, you're doing it for lots and lots of different things, so all of those things just get muddled up with each other, so you don't remember it. The other thing is we don't transfer information from devices to the real world very well. So um, studies have been done with kids um, where they've shown them a block task on a little iPad and then giving them the box in real life versus showing them the block task in real life and then giving them the blocks on the iPad. Uh-huh. If you the, the task on an iPad and then give them the blocks in real life, they're much poorer at actually doing the task than if you show them in real life and then give them the block task on an iPad. They've also done it where they've just um, had actors behind a screen and they've told the children, oh, it's a screen and so this is a recording versus, no, there's actors behind there, and they remember what the people did behind the screen better if they think it's real people behind the screen versus <laughs> actually a screen. So we don't we treat stuff that's online as being easily accessible and temporary. And so it even comes to the smart board. So if you are a teacher and you whack up on the smart board what kids have to do that day, they're going to remember that less. They're going to have less poor memory for that then if you stood up and wrote on the whiteboard the information, they're going to remember that more because you put effort into it and they see it as being in the real world. Whereas if you do it online, if you do it on a smartphone, uh-huh. whatever, right. then they see it as online and so therefore it's not temp, it's not them. Those things aren't them. So talk a little bit, if you would please, about the effects of all these technology applications in our homes and how that has affected not just the academic learning process, but the social emotional development of our kids at home. I know you were telling me about research that is showing how you know, kids are affected by parents, for example, who walk around with an iPhone or kids who sit at the table and everybody's got their iPhone in front of them. Discuss that a little bit. I know that there's some implications there. 
Yeah, there's some, there's some great research coming out from the US um, where they spend uh, several groups have been um, taking all the CCD TV footage from um, uh, different um, restaurants and so on and looking at how the parents are interacting with the children um, when they're out for dinners, for example, um, or when they're at McDonald's or those sorts of things. And they've shown that the children, parents who um, have an iPhone in front of them um, don't make the same don't have the same responses to the children as those that don't have the iPhone. So when you're looking at an iPhone and a child, for example, falls over and hurts themselves, you don't make the facial expressions that are appropriate for the child mm. to understand that they've actually hurt themselves. And that's where we learn all those information. So, you know, a child falls over and hurts themselves and the parent looks sad or looks worried, the child then knows, oh, that facial expression means that that person is being empathetic towards me is is feeling that I'm hurting myself. Or um, if they do something good, if they do you know a great you know flip or whatever, um, the parent doesn't smile in response to that. So the child doesn't learn that association between I do something good and someone smiles at me, which also mm. releases dopamine and all these good neurotransmitters that make them feel good as well. And so we now know that um, children whose parents spend a lot of time on a phone, don't have the same ability to read facial expressions as a child who, whose parents aren't on the phone or care or isn't on the phone um, during all of those interactions. We also now know that the earlier a child is actually using a phone, the more likely they are to have ADHD or ADD, to be diagnosed with wow. ADD. And the more time any child spends on a phone, the more likely they are to have diagnosis of ADD symptoms um, because of the fact that they're on the phone. Um, and there's a great study, um, and they've now done several follow-ups to it, showing that um, if a child, they took grade six children, and these were normal grade six kids, and they just took them on camp for five days. So they're, they're away on camp, and they didn't have access to any of their phones or any of their devices or anything like that. It was out in the wilderness, and there was no um, internet access and so on. And during those five days, they had a significant increase in their ability to recognise facial expressions, which really scares me because that means that a normal kid these days has has an abnormal level of facial expression ability. Now, facial expression is is so important for empathy and understanding. You know, having interactions with other people means reading their facial expressions and understanding those facial expressions. But great kids today significantly impaired in that ability. But only five days away from the device has meant that they improve, which is great to know we can actually improve with this, but we need to get them off the Let devices. me just put a plug in here. Um, young parents who are taking their children into the supermarket, for example, uh, and as they're walking through the supermarket, they have their iPhone in front of them or the, um, you know their ear, as they're talking to someone and they're putting things in the basket and their child is sitting in the basket. I used to do a uh, program for young mothers and it's so important to put that phone away while you're doing something as simple as grocery shopping and talk to your child about what you're going to have for dinner and show them the spaghetti package you're putting in the basket and um, maybe even let them reach out and grab it. Um, I would encourage people, uh, parents, mothers, fathers, whoever's taking the child with them, whether it's grocery shopping or out for a walk even, put the phone away, talk about the trees, talk about the birds. Um, I just I just needed to get that plug in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It makes me really sad when I go to a cafe and there's you know, a family sitting there and yeah. the kids are getting iPads to play with rather than actually interacting with each other. Um, it's, it's so important. We, we know that the brain um, is plastic. It's, it's neuroplasticity. We've known that for a long time now and we've done a lot of research in this area. And, and, and it's, a, it's a matter of use it or lose it. So the, the abilities that we use, we actually get better at and the abilities that we don't use, we actually lose. They actually. And so if you're not actually, A, if you're not developing them to begin with, which they're not having the opportunity to develop them because they're on these devices, and then you yourself, Perhaps have to um, use those abilities too to actually continue on being able to use them. 
but otherwise they do atrophy. And we know that they atrophy. And it, it's, it's amazing that, you know, there's lots of these apps now to stop our brains from atrophying, which are, you know, Sudoku and all these other, you know, maths games or word games or oh. whatever. So do these and you, your brain will be really good. The number one thing for actually increasing activity in your brain, actually exercising your brain, is to look at another person. That activates our brain more than anything else. Being social, actually interacting with someone else, activates more parts of our brain, gets more parts of our brains working than anything else we can do. So, you know, if you actually want to exercise your brain or exercise your kids' brains, get them to talk to someone, and that will actually exercise it more than anything else. So just to recap for a minute, would you agree that uh, it's better for kids to practice math by doing math problems on paper rather than on an app, that it's better to have kids learn to take notes rather than hand out all these handouts with all the information already on it. Um, do you want to throw some things in here? That yeah, absolutely. Appropriate? <laughs> um, are you writing with a pen results in better memory retention than typing? The full stop. This great study recently came out um, showing that they, they, they just looked at two different primary schools. One of the primary schools was teaching the, the children when they first arrived there to type on computers. The other one was teaching them how to write with a pen. Um, the kids who were taught how to write with a pen had significantly better reading skills than the ones that were taught to type. They had significantly better reading skills. Now, reading is extremely important for education. No matter what you do, whether you do maths, or science, STEM, or whatever, you need good reading ability. So, just teaching kids how to actually write with a pen rather than typing resulted in better reading skills. We also know you get better retention when you write notes than when you type. When you write, you actually um, use different motor plans for each letter within each word. So, you, again, you're generating a different motor a different neural response, similar to getting kids to sit somewhere differently, yeah? And so you get better neural um, processing of that. When you type, you actually use the same motor plan regardless of which letter you're actually typing. So all of the motor planes are exactly the same regardless of the letter you're typing because you're just pushing a button. You're not actually forming a letter. So you actually remember better. You actually remember even better if you um, draw pictures than if you write mm -hmm. notes. So if you learn, I mean, I, I always laugh. And in my um, undergraduate neuroscience course, usually about a thousand students, and I can always tell the students that are going to be the high distinction students because they're the ones that turn up with a notepad, which adds to all the links and anchors that we were talking about before. So they actually remember the information that they're writing even better because they have all those links and anchors. I think writing notes and teaching kids how to write good notes is something missing from education systems all around the world. And I think it should be a real priority. A, learning how to read and B, learning how to take notes should be the two big priorities in any school because it makes such a big difference later on. When I was teaching, we used to teach the kids the Cornell note-taking system. I don't think uh, any three, of the teachers yeah. even know what that is today. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It's very it's, it, And it, that's a great system um, and it's been proved over many, many, many years now um, and should be in all curriculum and isn't in any, as you said, um, which is really um, concerning. What is um, the Pomodoro technique that you talked about with me? What is that? So the Pomodoro, Pomodoro means um, tomato in Italian, um, and it's actually based on um, the old the, in, in Italy they have these old tomato timers. So it's, it's a, a food timer um, that you just twist around, and then it counts down for you so that you know when your spaghetti's ready to pull out of the thing or whatever um and so that's what it's based on and that's what they use that's how old this technique is but um they've shown that if you break down your day into 25 minute segments and you set a timer that counts down and you focus on one thing and just one thing and one thing only for that 25 minutes and then as soon as that timer goes off then you stop and you have five minutes off and you get up and move so you've got to move your you know do squats or just you know, do a stretch or whatever, and then come back. Um, the important thing is that you you can see the timer. So if you get to you know twenty minutes and you're, you're starting to um, have a little difficulty, you look up and you go, oh, "I've only got five minutes left." 
I can really concentrate now so that I can concentrate for that extra five minutes and get through it. And you do that four times, so 25 minutes, five minutes off, 25 minutes, five minutes off, 25 minutes off. Oh. And you do that four times and that's two hours. And then you have a longer break. You have a 15-minute break or a 20-minute break. The important thing is, one, you've got to concentrate on one thing and one thing only during that time. So you've got to turn off all your other notifications and everything else so that you don't get disrupted. Now, this works extremely good in classrooms. We've, I've done this with a whole bunch of um, school psychologists working with kids with ADD. And one, one child with ADD would not sit still for more than um, 20, 30 seconds at a time. It was really, really difficult. And so we started off with 15 seconds that they had the timer on for, and then we increased and increased and kept increasing incrementally. And now that child sits for 20 minutes without interruption. We'll sit for 20 minutes and concentrate without interruption. I also did with that a girl, um, a teacher in the UK, and she had a student who had autism and was a truant and had just started her class. Within four weeks of using the Pomodoro technique, she used to get really upset with her parents on a Saturday because she couldn't go to school. And she loved school so much mm. because she was able to sit and concentrate and learn. Right. Which we all love learning once we actually know how to do it. And so, yeah, so you slowly incrementally increase the amount of time depending on the age of the children and you can actually get them to a long, quite a long period of time. Um, you can actually buy timers now, the you know, fancy ones that, you know, have um, teddy bears and things that will do that. Or you can... Um, download there's a couple of apps that you can download if you're really into technology and you need to use technology but they'll actually tell you what to do so there's ones for teachers that will after the however long and 20 minutes if it's a, a younger class or 15 minutes if you're a younger class it'll then say okay you've got to now jump up and you've got all got to do 20 star jumps or you've all got to do <laughs> all those sorts of things so the teachers don't even have to think about what they're going to do during those little breaks but it's extremely good for productivity it's been shown for Many years, very good for productivity for older people. Um, and it's extremely good in the classroom to keep all your students on task. But again, you've got to just get them to focus on one thing for that period of time. Um, and you just adjust it depending on the age of the kids that you're actually working with or if they have any sort of disabilities that you need to factor in there. But it's a great way to extend their attention, to extend that ability to sit there and actually concentrate on one thing. Getting kind of toward the end, and I, this has been wonderful. You've given us some amazing pieces of information. I'm wondering if there's anything in particular that we didn't get to that you feel is important for mentors to hear, educators, parents, or other people who are working with kids. Any bullet points that you might want to throw out there that you think are important? Uh, yeah. Um, so some of the things that I think really we, we need to focus on, one is the connection that it's really important to me that, you know, teachers get that connection with the students and realize that students who aren't connecting aren't going to hear them the same way as kids who are connecting. So that connection is really, really important. And I remember I, I do a lot of work with, um, schools from low socioeconomic areas. So schools that are struggling. Uh, I remember one teacher who was absolutely amazing teacher in this school and this, school had there was some really big problems in the school but he was doing great with the students and so I, I wanted to sort of view what he was doing and in the morning what he would do he, is he, he would come out to the front of the class outside and as each child came to his door he, he, these were um, grade six kids so they were you know quite small um, he would get down on his knees and he would shake each kid's hand and each kid he had a different shake for you know, he oh, that's done so all. cool! Wow. Yeah, and I say, how remember was that? Wow. <laughs> he would say, "How was your day? How was your how was your night? Um, how are things going? What do you want to do today?" And he would, you know, find out from his kids what they wanted to do that day, and he would try to factor that into the day. And he had the best retention. And at that school, they had about forty to fifty percent truancy in his class. He had about eighty. To 90% of the kids would turn up. Wow, wow. What a personal, personalizing the connection that he had with each child. Each child felt so valued because it was so individualized. Yes, yeah. And these kids lack that when they're at home. Well, a lot of them do lack that at home. There's a lot of wonderful people from like uh -huh. different status areas. But there's also issues also 
that occur. And so, yeah, for them to have that meant that they wanted to come to school because that was where they had a connection and that's where they really, um, and, and they did great and he, he, he got amazing results. But I think, yeah, that connection is really important. And the other thing is, uh, you know, to don't chase after new and bright things. <laughs> new and bright things aren't always best. <sighs> Um, and that's, I think, a big problem that we have. We need more research into the techniques that we're using, um, but a lot of the best techniques for actually learning are the older ways, using a pen and paper, writing things down, learning from books. These are things that actually work. Um, experiential learning or um, inquiry-based learning actually doesn't work. It's not actually beneficial for the students. Yeah. Explicit learning, actually getting a teacher to actually teach kids, actually works. It actually works really, really well. Um, and it, it is the best way that we know. And that is because there is a connection between you and the, and the student, which has been going on for 150 million years. Um, and there's actually a, a relationship between you and the teacher. And if you like, I can send you this some great review papers on I think that would be great. Um, we'll put those up as, as links so that people yeah. can do some of their own due diligence if they want to delve into this further. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. You've given a lot of time to help me put this together, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, I, I think we can kind of end by saying that technology can be both a blessing and a curse, <laughs> and uh, we need to learn more about how to use it effectively so that it doesn't do just the opposite of what we want it to do. And that's impede the development of the students that we're trying to work with. Um, thank you all for listening. I look forward to having you back as we continue in our quest for data and the professionals who are going to become our resources for this information. Each piece of information helps us to clarify the path that we choose to support our kids. Thank you, everyone. Be safe and stay connected. Thank you, mentors, for being with us today. If you found this podcast of value, please visit JustEducationFirst.com to subscribe to our blog and Mentorship and Education podcast so that you may continue the exploration with us. Our goal is to provide a free treasury of information for our listeners so they can become acquainted with the amazing resources that we have available to us. We want to thank all of our guests for giving their time and sharing their wealth of information with us. Please also visit their websites and explore more of their resources to further your pursuit of the topic. Hope to hear from you at JustEducationFirst.com. Have a good week and thank you.